Uh, we are coming close to wrapping up our study on your questions and God's answers. Um, have you guys enjoyed the study so far? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, questions that you guys have, I think it's been pretty beneficial. I've really enjoyed this. one of the, my favorite things that we do uh, the last couple of times that we've done this. But tonight, we're going to look at the question of what do I do if I'm questioning my faith? Maybe, maybe tonight you're like, haven't we already covered that? We, we covered something kind of similar to that. Um, we looked at a question that said, what do I do if I don't feel saved? So if you kind of remember, I kind of thought about putting these two together. thought about, you know, the question of do I feel saved and my question of my faith, that's kind of the same thing. You're kind of asking the same question. But the reason I separated them out is because I felt like they're coming from two completely different places. I feel like you're, you're both kind of experiencing doubt whether I'm, whether I don't feel saved or I'm questioning my faith, but I feel like they're kind of driven in two different areas, right? So if I don't feel saved, that's kind of more emotion-based. But if I'm questioning my faith, this is more of a... No, understanding faith and what it is and how it works and kind of understanding how I can have faith in my faith. So tonight we're not going to focus on emotions, but rather we're going to focus more on faith. Okay, so we're going to answer the question. If we're going to answer the question about questioning faith, then we have to define what faith is. So uh, you don't have to turn there. I have it on the screen. It's just one verse. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. How many of you came to Disciple Now this past November? A good majority, about half of the room. Okay, um, We gave each of you a devotional titled Truth. Who's reading their devotional every day? You're caught up. Wow, that's actually more than I thought. Good job. I, that's, I'm very proud of you guys for that. When I was in... Uh, when I was a, in youth group, that wasn't something that I did. That was a that's something I'm still kind of working through. Right? That's kind of a discipline that I'm still, even to this day, working through. Because yeah, I'm studying for sermons, but am I actually doing my daily Bible studies? So that's something I, even as an adult, I'm still kind of working through that discipline. Uh, but actually, I read that same devotional. So me and Lori actually do those too. So the same devotional that you guys have is the one that that I'm working through as well. And I like that because on January 11th, this scripture of Hebrews 11.1 1 was actually the focus point for that day. There was a great illustration that the writer used um, that I want to kind of help us help define what faith is. Josh McDowell is, is the author of that. And what he talks about, he talks about faith plus. It's faith plus the evidence and knowledge of the things not seen. So here's the illustration that he used. How many of you have ever flown on a plane? What about a helicopter before? Helicopter. Yeah, helicopter. Yeah, that's fine. We can talk about helicopter. That's fine. No. All right, so if you've ever flown on a plane, you have exercised faith, right? You believe the pilot could fly the plane safely, even though you, you've never met him, you've never even seen him, you probably didn't see him the whole time you were flying, right? But you have faith that he can fly the plane safely. You probably didn't see the engineers or the machinists who built the plane but you believed the plane was safe. You felt safe because of the airline company's good track record and their pilots. You put your faith in the plane and the pilot plus the evidence that planes are a pretty safe form of travel. So it's faith plus evidence that gave you assurance that it's okay to get on that airplane and fly. So when we talk about a saving faith in Jesus Christ, for us, what that means, what, what I, when I talk about that in here, what we're talking about is this means we have received the reality of eternal life because we have faith that we will spend eternity with God in heaven. And that proof comes from God's Word, because God's Word tells us that. So we have faith that God will do what He says He's going to do, and then we have the proof of His Word to say we're going to receive that. So we have the assurance of salvation by our faith, and the evidence that we see in God's Word. So let's answer the question, right, where does faith come from? I think we need to kind of start there. Where does faith come from? First person to find it. Everybody's got the table of contents ready. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Sierra. One, what did you say? 1,076. 1,076. 
Whatever, close right now. First Peter chapter three. 1077 in the base Bible. 1077. First Peter chapter three. 1077. Actually, you were wrong. It's 1076. He says you're saying 1077. That's chapter four. Okay. Well, if you go to that page, look to your left, and you'll see it. All right. Here we go. All right. Well, let's start in verse 18. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, in which he also made, went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient, when God patiently waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared. In it, a few, that is, eight people, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. So, verses 18 and 19, they give us a great insight into faith. This says, Christ suffered for all sins. He is the righteous, and we are the unrighteous. And he suffered for all sins, that he might bring you to God. The Bible says that he went and made proclamation to your spirit. Right? So that's what salvation is. It's the Holy Spirit, God himself, comes into this place or wherever you're at, and what he does is he makes a proclamation to your spirit. And that's what we talk about him drawing us to himself. How, what does that mean when we talk about him drawing us into himself? It's his spirit making a proclamation. Basically, his spirit speaking to you, letting you know that you need salvation. That's what it is. So we don't make a proclamation to the Lord because the Lord makes a proclamation to us. He comes to us. We don't have to go to him. He's not sitting back waiting on us. He's active. He moves towards us. And he speaks and he makes a proclamation to our spirit. The only reason any of us are a Christian is because God came and made a, a proclamation to our spirit and we responded. That's the only reason why any of us have any faith at all, is through his movement and his pursuit of us. Now, I love how verses 20 through 22 really drive this point home. The writer of Hebrews goes back to the story of Noah's ark. And while Noah was good in the ark, the, the Bible talks about God being patient. Noah was giving a warning to the people. He said, there's a flood coming, and God's going to wipe the earth off, and anyone who wants to be saved is to come in the boat. And everybody just made fun of him. Dude, it's not even raining. It's not even cloudy. What are you talking about? Is it going to rain? This is so ridiculous, right? It's such a ridiculous claim in the desert and a drought to say, hey, the world's going to flood, and I'm building a boat. Get on. No one's biting on that. But there was still opportunity after opportunity for the people to turn from their evil ways and join Noah and his family on the ark. But the people just continued to reject God's invitation. So the Spirit is making a proclamation, hey, get on the boat. But the people still had a responsibility to respond, and we see that they didn't. The Bible says that only eight people were saved from the floodwaters. And now the waters that once were a sign of destruction for mankind has now become a sign of salvation. Because it talks about baptism. Right? So, so the flood waters come and the waters destroy mankind. But God uses that water as a sign of our salvation through our baptism. So we've defined faith. We've looked at where it comes from. Now let's see what it looks like. First person to find it, James chapter 2. Give you a hint, you don't have to go far. James chapter 2. James 2, verse 14. You don't have to go. 1071. It is right around the corner. Got crunch bars, Milky Way. I'm just trying to get it. I'm Jason. So it should have a couple pages back. So where you were, just a couple pages back. 1071. 
We're going to be in verse 14. James chapter 2, verse 14. 1072. 1072. James chapter 2, verse 14. So let's see what, what faith actually looks like. James 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed. But you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, if faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I'll show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one, good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. So James is sort of <clears throat> working out the balance of faith and works. Okay, So if someone claims to have faith, but does not have works, can such faith say them? This is such a loaded question. This is such a big question. And the problem this verse has is if we were to stop there, that would be a huge discussion for us, right? Because how we would answer that? We would answer that through our own, wherever we're at, right? And so it would be my own personal Christian maturity, and maybe uh, I would be able to answer that question based off of my life experience and some of the things that's happened to me. Right? Or maybe it's my own desire for what I want the Bible to say to kind of make things easier for me. But the good thing is James doesn't stop there. He kind of helps answer that question. In verses 15 through 17, we're given an example of faith alone. What he, what he means by that is faith apart from works. So all you have is faith and you have no works, which means you don't do anything with your faith. There's nothing that you do that shows that you're a Christian. So if we see someone without clothes and lacking daily food, and our response to them is, Stop that. Don't be hungry. Don't be in need. Just go get some things that you need. Go, go just, don't be in need. Just, just go get what you need. And that's our response. If we don't do anything to help them out, what did we just do? Nothing. Did we help them out in any way? No. And that's a really silly, kind of a silly example that James gives here. But the Bible says that if you claim to have faith, but you don't have works and your faith is dead. It's meaningless. It's not helpful. It's like going to, to a homeless person and saying, just go buy a house. It's just not that easy, right? There's more that they need than just a house. They need all the means that they need to get there. So if we're not willing to help them out, then we're not really doing anything. So specifically, the Bible just asks, what good is it if you have faith and no works? So this past year, Disciple Now, we, we took food boxes to a neighborhood in Shepherdville, right? Right, and I think everyone enjoyed that a whole lot, right? Um, so, how do you think it would have turned out if we would have went there to a house and said, Hey, um, would you like a food box? Yeah. Okay, well, there's a food line right around the corner. Go, go get you some food. Go to the next house. <laughs> hey, there's a food line. Do you want some food? Just go get some. Well, what good would that, uh, what do you think that, how well do you think that would have turned out? Nice. That would have been... A lot different story we walked away with than what we did, right? So what we did is we actually gave them a week's supply of groceries. Hey, would you like a food basket? Yes. And we gave them a box full of food, a week's worth of food. So, and through that, we hear story after story, house after house. I hear you guys discussing the gospel with... Grown adults, I, I actually hear you all inviting grown adults to church. Not just teenagers, but adults. that You have no idea who they are. Sharing the gospel and inviting adults to church. I saw one of our students actually take a food box inside the house to a woman who had just lost her husband. <coughs> and what that did, and one of the things that, that she shared, and some of her even other family members shared, was that it was nice to see that there's young people in the community who actually care. So, did we... Just provide her food? No, we showed her there's people in this community that care that she just lost her husband. I got to speak to a girl who was cleaning out her dad's apartment because he had just passed away and she didn't get all of this stuff out. And she was really upset over that. And obviously, we would expect to be. But I was, I was able just to listen to her, let her kind of vent a little bit. I prayed with her and 
He gave her a box and we just left. But guys, going to a going into a neighborhood, knocking on doors and just giving out food, it seems so simple. And to us, it might even feel like we didn't do anything. But guys, that's exactly what faith looks like. That's what it looks like. It's our works driven by our faith. The whole reason we were there is because of our faith. Because of my faith, I have works. We serve because we believe what the gospel says. Our salvation drives our ministry. Salvation drives the ministry. We don't do this for any other reason than because that we love God and we love people. And this, we're given that direction through his word. But in verses 18 and 19, we see the opposite, right? We see what it looks like to have works but no faith. So work apart from faith. There's almost a challenge from James when he says, Show me your faith without works and I'll show you faith by my works. He's not implying that his actions are saving him or that he's earning salvation. What he's saying is his works are the result of his faith. Right? So we gave out food to a neighborhood because of our faith. Because he has faith, he has works. And here's that, what the principle really looks like in our world today. See, there's this mentality that has to be corrected in the church. There's this mentality that we have picked up somewhere along the way. I'm not even sure where this came from. But here's kind of the idea that the church is kind of operating under right now. Is that our pastor shares the gospel, he ministers to the people around him, and what we do is we're just his cheerleaders and we're going to support him as he goes. The problem with that mentality is that your pastor needs you to be on the team. He needs a teammate, not a cheerleader. And that's what we're looking for, right? We need somebody who's going to suit up, get on the field, and get in the game. You have a personal responsibility to share the gospel. Ministry is not set up for the people in the church who have positions. It's not for the youth pastor, the children's director, and the senior pastor to be doing ministry. Our ministry is to you so that you can go from here and do ministry. This is as far as the ministry goes. As far as my responsibility is different from yours. Once we leave this place, we are all on the same team. We all have a responsibility to go preach Jesus and share the gospel with this community. So you don't have a different ministry than me. We all have the same responsibility and call on our lives. And every Christian has the exact same call on their life. See, the people of God cannot be divided up into two camps. We cannot have the ones who are sharing the gospel and, doing, and being doers of the word, and those who are just consuming seats on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, and just being hearers of the word. We can't have the doers and the hearers. We can't have the ones who are doing ministry and those who are just, I'm just going to sit over here quietly and just cheer you guys on and support you. And I just love that you guys are doing it. But you know what? That's just not for me. I love, but I love to hear your stories. We don't need two different teams. We're all on the same team. We all have the exact same responsibilities. We all must be hearers and doers of the word. The verse 19, though, guys, is a haunting text. It says, you believe that God is one. Good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. So this is saying the same thing as verse 16. It's saying, well, what good is it? To have works and no faith, what good is it? Because having a faith without works is exactly how the demons are described in James chapter 2. Do you think that Satan and the demons know exactly who Jesus is? Do you think they know who God is? Do you think they have no I mean, do you just think that they're just completely lost and they have no idea, like we know things about God that he doesn't? Do you think there's anything about God or Jesus that we know that Satan isn't already aware of? Absolutely not. But just because they know who Jesus is, that doesn't mean they respond to who he is. So the Bible says, what do they do? They shudder. Why? Because they know exactly who he is and where they stand and they know what the Bible says is in store for them but they don't respond. They shudder in fear. They are terrified. They are not going to respond. But because of his authority they are still in terror of him. So we've defined faith. We've found out where faith comes from. We've seen what it looks like. So if I'm questioning my faith, guys, what exactly am I questioning? Right, so I mean, am I questioning 
whether or not I'm worthy of salvation? Is that really our question? Am I worthy of salvation? Raise your hand if you've ever committed a sin, ever in your entire life. Raise your hand. Keep it up. Is any, everybody's hand up, right? Everybody's paying attention? Just making sure, right? So leave your hand up for a second. If your hand is up, you are a sinner, and you just left heaven to come save sinners. So your hand being up shows that you're what? Worthy of salvation. So you can put your hands down. By our hands being up, we've all determined... I am worthy of salvation. Why? Because I'm a sinner. I am the reason that Jesus left heaven, came to earth, and died on a cross for me. Your hand was up. That was because of you. So you are worthy of salvation. So what am I questioning? Am I questioning my assurance of salvation? If I'm questioning my faith, what that means is that I'm experiencing doubt. And this type of doubt boils down to one thing. Is God actually able to cover and forgive my sins? My sins. Is God actually able to do that? Yeah, I, I hear the Bible talks about God forgiving sins. But that's, that's probably other people's sins. I mean, you don't know what, what I've done, what I'm going through. You don't know the part that I've played. I mean, I'm surely God is forgiving other people's sins, but I'm not sure that God's forgiving mine. Well, let's turn to Romans chapter 5. First one to find it. Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. There's no way. We're going to let somebody else play the game. Are you like cheating on my notes or something? Yeah. Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8. Makes it what you want. It's 75. It's good. What is it? I got it. Here we go. What was it, Tyler? Romans 5, 8. No, no, no. What page? What page? <coughs> 1,000 even. Oh, I was 90 off. 1,000. I was 90. All right, here we go, guys. Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, 8. We're going to look at verses 8 and verse 9. Remember, here's what we're asking. Is God actually able to forgive my sin? Romans 5, 8. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, will, will we be saved through him from wrath? So verse 9 says that your righteousness has been declared how? Through the blood of Jesus. Not your obedience, not your ability to, to just do all the right things and, and follow all the rules. You've been declared righteous through the blood of of Jesus. There's nothing about your effort in that at all. It's through His work that you are declared righteous. There's nothing about your effort, your ability to clean yourself up, your ability to follow all the rules. There's nothing in that text about you, your efforts, and your abilities. It's not because you're good enough that you're declared righteous. You're declared righteous because God is good enough. Not because of you. Gosh, that's great News. You know why that's great news? Because you will never be able to be good enough to save yourself. You'll never be able to be good enough and follow all the rules and do everything you need to do to deserve heaven. So the good news of the gospel is that it is not declaring that you're going to be good enough, but the fact that God is good enough and he will cover you and he will make you righteous through his blood. Guys, that's great news. Great news. So just breathe and relax. It's not sitting on your shoulders. It's not on your shoulders. Your salvation is through the blood of Jesus. And praise God, it's not through our obedience because we will never be able to be perfectly obedient in that. So, in the questioning of your faith, you're actually questioning Romans 5 9. So it says that I'm declared righteous by his blood. And if you're questioning your faith, you're putting in question that verse. Do you believe that verse to be true? You guys believe that verse to be true, that we're declared righteous through his blood? But now, guys, do you believe it to be true for you? For you personally. Not for everyone else in this room. Not for other people. For you. Is that true in your heart? Do you know that to be true for you? Because there's a big difference. Because far too many times we beat each other up, we beat ourselves up. That God can't save me. I hear that, yeah, I'm declared righteous through his blood, 
That's for other people. It's not, guys. It's for you. It is true for you. So here's our plea, and then here's his promise. This Psalm 138, I have it on the screen. Psalm 138, verses 7 and 8. It says, If I walk into the thick of danger, you will preserve my life from the anger of my enemies. You will extend your hand. Your right hand will save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Lord, your faithful love endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. So here's our plea before God, guys. Protect me in difficult times. Are we going to have difficult times? 100%. I, we're, you guys are teenagers. I almost said we. You guys are teenagers, right? You're teenagers. There's going to be difficult times, right? That's to be expected. That's to be normal. But our plea to God is protect me during those difficult times. And God's promise is that he will extend his hand and save you. But we have to understand what that means. That does not mean that you are going to be untouchable. That does not mean that you will never experience disappointment and defeat. That does not mean that you will never be hurt or injured. And that does not mean that no one that you care for and love is going to die. It's not what that means. That's why verse 8 is so important. Because verse 8 says, The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. And we have to understand that His purpose for me may make things I go through look like He's not saving me. Because we don't always understand where he's leading us. And there's things that we have to go through that's going to lead us into something else, to lead us into something good. The Bible says that everything we experience is for our good. And that's based off of his promise and his purpose for me. It is made perfectly clear in Hebrews 11. I've used this scripture before, and I love this scripture. Hebrews 11, here's what it says. By faith, some conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength and weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. And guys, that sounds like God is just saving people after saving people after saving his people. Right? I can put foreign armies to flight. I can escape the edge of the sword. I can shut the mouths of lions. I'm in. Sign me up. That's what I want. Right? And by my faith, I can do those things. But guys, then the, the Hebrews 11 continues. And it says, Others, by their faith, were tortured, not accepting release, experienced the mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They, were, they died by the sword. They were poor, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. And the chapter ends by saying all of these people were faithful. The ones who were faithful shut the mouths of lions and conquered enemies. And those same people who were faithful also were killed by the sword and were destitute and were broke and were sawed in two. Because of their faith, some conquered and because of their faith, some were devoured. And it's, the Bible says they were all faithful. But those who experienced the bad things, I love what the Bible says here. It says they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us. And being a follower of Jesus requires us to be aware that his purpose for me is not my purpose for me. If I had my choice 10 years ago, I, I had no idea that I would be here, that this wasn't my goal, to be here 10 years ago. My goals and my desires and my dreams are focused on the things in this life. Yes, I want to be successful in ministry. Yes, I want to see this group grow. Yes, I want to see this school, and, and I want to see you guys reach your school for Jesus. But what if God's purpose for me is to lead this group just to a certain point and for someone else to see this group and lead this group to reach your schools for Jesus and to reach this community for Christ. What if I don't get to see all those things that I have a plan for, but I'm just going to lead to a point and someone else takes over and gets to see all the fruits? What if we grow, what if we don't grow anymore 
I've seen this group grow from 16 to 45. And the goal is to get to 50. But what if I never see that goal? And I, the Lord calls me somewhere else. And the next person comes in and this group gets to 65. That's because, guys, it's important that we understand that the Bible talks about us playing our part. See, the Lord has a purpose for you. And it says to play your part. Don't play the part of other people. Don't be envious of others because that's their part. It's not necessarily your part. Play your part. Play it well. Look at what God did with Moses. He called Moses to free the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. He, had them, he, had, he led them in the desert for 40 years. They, they finally get to the promised land, right? So they're going to finally, all of these 40 years in the desert, this is about to be over with. Here's the promised land. Everything's about to get a lot easier. And God takes Moses up on the mountain, shows him the promised land, and Moses is like, all right, I'm ready to go. Let's go. And God says, no, no, you're going to die on this mountain, and Joshua's taking him in. I'm like, really? I read that, and I'm like, why, God? He was faithful to lead these people through the desert for 40 years, and all of this is about to pay off. You're just going to kill him and leave him dead on the mountain? And Joshua gets to reap all the benefits? That just doesn't seem fair to me. But Hebrews 11 reminds me, God had provided something better for Moses than the promised land. He had something better in store. He had something better in mind. As great as the promised land was going to be, Moses in that moment, when he died on the mountain, got to experience something far greater than the promised land. He got to experience the promised kingdom for all eternity. That's much greater than anything that Joshua was going to experience by taking that group into the promised land. And guys, and that's God's purpose. That's God's purpose for every single one of us. The Bible says that God desires for everyone to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So let me ask you guys, have you done that? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation? Because guys, you can't question a faith that you don't have. Right? We can't answer this question, you know, what do I do if I'm questioning my faith if we don't have a faith? If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you know that tonight you're a Christian, let me ask you this. Are you actually trusting God to fulfill his purpose for you? Are you working to fulfill your own promise or your own purpose for yourself? Trusting in God but relying on yourself is not trusting in God at all. Right? So we say the right thing, like, I'm going to trust God for this, and then what do we do? We do the best that we can to make sure that we get that. That's not us trusting God. That's us trusting in ourselves. Everyone bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm looking around. Tonight, guys, if you're here and you know there was never a time in your life when you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, and you're thinking to yourself, I just don't know that God can forgive me. And you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm currently struggling in. You don't know how my week has gone. Like, I hear that he forgives people, but I just don't know that he forgives me. Listen to me tonight, guys. Jesus walked away from heaven to come to this earth for people who need forgiveness just like you, who has done things just like you, who has struggled with the same things that you are struggling with. And he has willingly given his life on a cross for you. See, guys, his life wasn't taken. His life was willingly given for you. And regardless of how you walked in this place tonight, regardless of whatever you did, whatever you said, doesn't matter how you came in here, the Holy Spirit is here to call you to him for salvation, to make a declaration to your spirit. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, and there's something tugging at your heart that you want to be saved tonight, I'm going to ask you something. Just raise your hand up real high right where you're at. 